the next speaker coming up to the podium teaches communications at Olds College and researches print cultures, both historic and modern. He is the secretary slash treasurer of the Canadian Society for the Study of Comics, which is probably the coolest treasury gig you could ever get. <laughs> so uh, give it up for Dr. Keith Friedlander. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you. Hey, everybody. How's it going? All right. So uh, in order to practice what I preach to my students, I'm going to do this without notes. So <laughs> pray for Mojo. <laughs> OK. So earlier this year, Black Panther broke domestic box office records <laughs> for a superhero movie. This is after 17 Marvel movies starring white dudes. So it's a bit overdue for some diversity. Now, part of what makes Black Panther a successful movie, it is the creative vision of black filmmakers, the cast, the writers, the director. This is part of a larger diversity movement in Marvel Comics. Over the last decade, they've been, they've been creating more diverse superheroes like Ms. Marvel, the Muslim superhero, and Miles Morales, the Afro-Latino Latino, Spider-Man. And they've also been doing a better job of hiring uh, creators that represent the characters they're writing for. But Marvel doesn't always do a great job supporting the diverse characters that they create. So America Chavez and Iceman, two of their LGBTQ characters, had their series canceled after less than a year. And more recently, Marvel filed, fired Chelsea Kane before her book series could even make it to the shelves. See, Chelsea Kane was the target of an online harassment campaign by a bunch of dudes who objected to the fact that she made a feminist superhero. There's a lot of this in comic culture. There's a lot of dudes online harassing women and driving them off social media with abuse and threats. Uh, you know, and it's baked into the industry as well. Uh, you know, last year, DC Comics had to fire one of its editors after they'd been accused multiple times over, over a decade of sexual harassment by coworkers. You know, in the years leading up to his being fired, their solution was don't let women work in his department. So why does comic culture have this toxicity? Well, there's a lot of reasons. One reason is it's a niche market. The average comic book sells about 25,000 copies in North America. Uh, think about that number. That would be a disaster in any other industry. But it's normal in comics. And you know, it used to be that comics sold hundreds of thousands of copies back when they were sold at newsstands and general stores. And they were sold pretty equally to men and women, boys and girls. And then, due to a number of market forces in the 60s and 70s, the comic market shifted to independent comic shops, and the demographics shifted with it. So this is one of those comic shops. This was my teenage comic shop that I spent a lot of time in as a kid, the comic room. Now, I loved it there. As a teenager, I never really understood why a windowless, claustrophobic basement <laughs> with only one narrow exit might not be an inviting environment for people who are afraid of being harassed while they're shopping for comics. But people who shop at comic books actually have a lot of influence over the industry. Part of that's because of the way the market is set up. It's very broken. Comic shop owners have to order their comics way in advance, and they're not allowed to return any of their stock for a refund, which makes it very hard for them to gamble on new titles. They basically have to order books that they know their fan base or their customer base is going to like. Fortunately, now there are lots of other places to buy comics. So since the late 90s, turn of the century, you know, you can go to a bookstore and buy graphic novels. You can go online and read web comics. You don't want to go to a comic store. Just wait for the series to be released as a trade paperback. Now, Marvel still makes most of its money, like 95% of its book revenues, through comic shops, through the direct market. But the creation of the book market has really opened up the comic book industry to lots of new publishers. So we have children publishers like Scholastic and manga publishers like Viz Media making 90% of their money through bookstores. And that's a really big market. So the number one comic sale, uh, number one comic author of 2016, that was Raina Tegel Tegelmeyer. She makes children's comics for Scholastic. 5% of all graphic novel sales in 2016 was Raina Tegelmeyer. Marvel wants a piece of that action. But you know what? Forget Marvel. There are lots of other places to find diversity in comics. Since the book market opened up, there has been an explosion in publishers of all sorts. So 
you know, let's see what else we can find for diversity out in the comic industry. Now, if we look at creator-owned labels like Image Comics and Oni Press, we can find radical feminist dystopias like Bitch Planet. We can find fantasy genres that are turned on their head like Another Castle, which subverts the damsel in distress uh, cliche. You know, if we look at prestige book publishers, uh, we can find uh, comics that are a little bit more grounded in reality. We can find American Born Chinese, which is just a masterwork of a young child coming to terms with an identity crisis and racial stereotypes. We can find the March Trilogy, which tells an autobiographical version of the civil rights from the perspective of Senator John Lewis. We can also look at comic publishers that are coming up through Kickstarters and crowdfunding. So those are things like Beyond Press and Iron Circus Comics that are not beholden to the restrictions of the market. They can create entire anthologies dedicated to, to queer creators and people of color. And those are the really important things. Those are the things that are really overdue in the comic industry is the creation of an infrastructure for a different kind of comic market for a different kind of reader. Publishers, stores, fan conventions, they're all creating spaces for diverse readers to come together. You know, diversity isn't new in comics. That's not what, what is overdue. You know, diversity has always been a part of comics. You know, since Superman, you know, Superman is an immigrant narrative. Since the 1970s, when Trina Robbins was bringing women comic creators together. In the 1990s, when Dwayne McDuffie was also bringing African-American comic creators together. It's always been a medium of diversity. It's just the whiny man babies who <laughs> you know, can't associate with anything that doesn't reflect their masturbatory self-image back on them <laughs> that think that comics are just for men. Comics are for everyone. Comics are a medium that is flowering in every single direction. So if you don't feel represented by mainstream media, if you are looking for something that represents you, there are comics for everyone out there. Go to a comic shop, go to a bookstore, go online. Just you know, read comics. Thank you.